Something that they are liberated Africans. It's not that there's plenty of free black men all over Havana. So it's not, and that's an important point, because there are places, especially in North America, where having large numbers of free black men who were soldiers would be unusual. This is not unusual in Havana. There's something about these men that are sort of setting off Cuban protest. When their language spoke vaguely to, of threats to the tranquility of the island, the fears of these authorities likely fit into at least three categories. First, the mere presence of the military vessel engaged in slave state suppression and staffed by a majority of free black men posed a symbolic challenge in a society based on racial slavery. Second, that such black soldiers would inevitably interact with the local black population, free and enslaved, making their challenge to social order more real than symbolic. And third, that these black soldiers might more specifically discuss with the local black population the details of how they came to be in that harbor as a part of these British policies. Lieutenant Charles Jenkins, the first commander of the Romney, in its new role, received the following recommendation as a part of his official instructions. Quote, in a service of this nature employed in a foreign port, every care and attention will be required on the part of yourself, the officers and men, by every means in your power to acquire the good opinion and respect of the public authorities and of the inhabitants. The challenge in the port of Havana in the 1830s and 1840s lay in the fact that the interests of the public authorities were, in many cases, specifically opposite to the interests and good opinions of many of the local inhabitants, and certainly of the local African inhabitants and people of African descent, a group which constituted at least half of the city's population. One might also further note that the interests and desires of the enlisted men themselves although legally constituted as, quote, black British subjects and citizens, did not always match the interests and desires of the British government or the white officers who commanded them directly. This is one thing that I am, I've given ver a version of this paper before in, in talking to Gwen Hall about this. There's a way to read this story that often has sort of British abolitionists on one side and Cuban pro-slavery on the other, and you kind of write these black British soldiers into some sort of very oversimplified abolitionist narrative. But these black soldiers, as those of you who do any sort of British or Caribbean history know, are often at war with their white commanding officers and how they view themselves as liberated Africans. Like, I don't want to read them as sort of somehow happy to be liberated Africans and safely in British protection, um, in contrast to that they, that they have a, they have a sense of themselves that certainly is a part of being there, but it has other sort of constitutive elements that I want to talk about. For example, where diplomacy and restraint in seeking not to antagonize Cuban authorities might have made sense at times for British policy interests, the opportunity for interaction, either social or otherwise, with fellow Africans, blacks, or mulattoes might have had greater value for the soldiers themselves. The Romney story thus also potentially contributes to understanding the nature of relationships between different segments of the African diaspora population in the 19th century Caribbean. Indeed, at the very time that British officials would devising policies for staffing the Romney as a receiving ship, several of those same officials were actively debating the differences between enlisting free black men born in the Caribbean colonies in the West India regiments in contrast to enlisting newly rescued liberated Africans. In the case of Havana, the threat quality of this kind of influence was perceived as being amplified by their military role. Excuse me. It's, um... I can just barely see in this darkness. You can see the PowerPoint, but I can't see. This paper is in part a close analysis of two aspects of the HMS Romney's history at Havana. First, who was on board the vessel? That is, if the black soldiers who served there formed a tiny community, or perhaps in effect a large household. <laughs> there you go. Can you guys still see? Yeah, can you guys still see? Because I'm, I'm, I was struggling a little bit with my reading. Which one, Alex? Fair. We're good. <laughs> okay. You can, can you guys? It's not that my PowerPoint isn't nearly as edited as other people. Yes. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so you guys can see that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Roseanne. Yeah. I, okay. I do this with my students too, so I'm not being. I'm trying to get this bad. I can't. Alex, <laughs> Alex can help you. I can't. I can't do both. Because <laughs> I want you guys to be able to see um, I, some of that, but I'm, I was having too much trouble with my text. Okay, that's good, thank you. This paper is in part a close analysis of two aspects of the HMS Romney's history at Havana. First, who was on board the vessel? That is, if the black soldiers who served there formed a tiny community and perhaps in effect a large household, what were the changing demographics of that community and how did they experience and understand the time they spent aboard ship and periodically on shore in the most thriving slave society of the 19th century Caribbean? 
Second, what was the nature of the most significant controversy which developed around the HMS Romney in the fall of 1840 when a group of these black soldiers and one of their white superiors became involved in a physical altercation with local pro-slavery Havana residents who sought and received the support of Spanish government authorities? Answers to the first question, which fits most within the methodological emphasis of this particular workshop, may be derived in part from British military records, which identified the groups of 20 to 30 soldiers which served on the vessel for terms ranging from six months to multiple continuous years. Um, what's there, and I am, this is my first experiment, experiment with actually having a pointer. Um, there's two things I want you to see. These are musters from the Romney, which do a couple of things, and I can't quite see here. There's an overall summary of who's on the ship, and it's mostly military men and how they're being fed. But then at the back of it, the last thing they all list was First West India regiments serving in view of Marines, which is kind of the point in these huge muster books that are, they do these quarterly, is, oh, by the way, they're Africans aboard these naval ships. And what, what the data in this case, they're, my records I use for this paper, I merge two sets of data. These musters are mostly, on if any of you have done military history, it's about feeding people. And the good thing about that is that it's about supplies being used. And so they have to account for who's eating and consuming everything. So it's not that they're particularly concerned from a Navy standpoint that these are, these are formulaic documents not made for Africans, that they then sort of write these um, liberated Africans into. And my sort of misfortune here is that if you, you can't quite see them is that by this point they all have lovely English names. Um, but we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, or most of them, I should say, have lovely English names. And those that don't, are actually kind of interesting. You know, that if, if just about every soldier is called George or John by this point, if you're still called, you know, Basso, why are you called Basso? <laughs> you know, you, at any rate. Um, access to the first question, which fit most within the methodological emphasis of this workshop, may be derived in part from British military records, which identify the groups of 20 to 30 soldiers which served on the vessel for terms ranging from six months to multiple continuous years. Meanwhile, a full dismantling of the 1840 dispute, which becomes the center of all their experience, will entail deconstruction of the two Cuban-led investigations and the years of diplomatic correspondence which follows. I want to give you a little bit of what happened with that one controversy, because in part it concerns African women um, in Havana who are Havana-based. But the present paper relies, for a start, um, not on the really lengthy Cuban investigations, but on some selected accounts of the incident, which, are present, which were presented to the British House of Commons. Um, what the HMS Romney is is a warship of just about 1,200 tons. It's expected to accommodate a crew of 68 men and boys. It's launched in 1815, and for much of its, its, its history, it served as a troop ship, which in part explains its selection for the posting in the Havana Harbor. During the eight years in Cuba, the ship typically carried a crew of approximately 50 people, which generally included a small number of boys belonging to the Royal Navy, a naval crew of about 20 people, and between 20 and 30 black soldiers from West India regiments. The ship arrived in Havana in the summer of 1837 with a naval crew of 21 people who were joined, and this is a key demographic at that point, by 34 black soldiers in September. From this date forward, the vessel maintained a mixed population of white and black men, with the latter, that is the black, in this case, as I'll be able to demonstrate, mostly African soldiers, almost always slightly outnumbering the white seamen. For the lived experience aboard the ship, this situation created, in effect, a clear black majority crew. The West India Regiment contingents usually included one British commanding officer, with all the rest being men of African descent, and almost all of them being privates. The Navy crews, meanwhile, included slightly more white officers as well as other individuals holding specialized jobs, such as surgeons and assistant surgeons, which put them outside the ranks of ordinary seamen. Indeed, the black soldiers did most of the day-to-day -day work of the vessel, thus while on strict numerical terms the Romney was an interracial space more than a black one, the frequent black majority crew and the more diffuse nature of the white presence could reasonably have given the ship this particular identity. It's worth saying, too, that in this period, there are also other people aboard this vessel, white seamen who found her, but also periodically you get black Cubans, both African-born and otherwise, who somehow get there and essentially say, help, I'm being mistreated in some kind of way. You've got African-American seamen who turn up and say that I've been wrongly imprisoned in Havana. So there's, um, this, is, this is a particularly interesting micro-history for both the liberated African presence, because they are the largest presence on this ship, but, but there's, a lot, there's a lot else going on. Like I kind of take, pluck them out for the purposes of this paper. 
It was the disputes about the black soldiers that became the most heated. Who exactly were these men that caused such controversy? Over the course of eight years, about 150 soldiers served aboard the Romney, but as already noted, at any given time, their number was usually less than 30 people. For most of the tenure of the vessel, the complement of soldiers came from a single regiment, the 2nd West India, which in this era had companies in Nassau, Bahamas, and in Jamaica, both near the Havana posting. In the mid-19th century, there was significant change and restructuring within the West India regiments. In the early 1820s, for example, the 2nd West India had companies based in Sierra Leone, as well as in the Bahamas and Belize. It was also in the period after 1815 that the number of regiments, once a high of 12, was reduced eventually to only two at the end of the century. With their principal service in the Caribbean and West Africa, the regiments also inhabited essentially the same circuit as the commerce and culture of slavery. And that's, you know, I stumbled to this population by accident, but that they are sort of their world is essentially the slavery and slave trade world. Originally recruited from among enslaved populations, these regiments in the 1830s consisted of free blacks born in the British Caribbean and Africa, and as already noted, significant numbers of Africans are enlisted after being rescued from captured slave ships. In a somewhat unusual procedure, the first of these soldiers to arrive in Havana to serve on the Romney came in two groups, 18 men in August of 1837 from the 2nd West India Regiment based in the Bahamas, and 14 men a month later from the 1st West India Regiment at Barbados. These two groups, however, were overwhelmingly, perhaps exclusively, African-born, and I'll explain why perhaps I was happy to see it probably come up in official documents this morning. Um, and evidence suggests that more than three-quarters of their number were liberated Africans rescued from foreign slave ships and immediately enlisted. In this respect, these armed, uniformed, so-called British soldiers almost literally mirrored the demographics of the enslaved population of Havana. That is, they were relatively young, African-born adults, most 10 years or fewer, removed from Africa. And they were people who had entered their encounter with Europeans, colonialism, and the Caribbean via the slave trade. Of the 16 men from the 1st West India Regiment from Barbados, all are identified in the Romney's musters being African-born, all likely from captured slave ships. The propriety of recruiting would-be soldiers directly from slave ships was debated in multiple quarters within the military and elsewhere in the British government. But Brian and I proposed that Lieutenant um, Colonel William Bush, who was the commander of the 1st West India Regiment at Barbados in the mid-1830s, was particularly willing to accept such recruits obtaining, quote, far more than he needed from this source. One of the things that I can't prove, but I'm, I'm suspecting, I think this was a deliberate act on the part of the British to essentially send liberated Africans to do this work. Because I did not realize that at the time, but it's tricky to prove that they were all liberated Africans, but, it's, but it seems that if they go to this, the first West India, which is at Barbados, where they have this large number of liberated Africans, I start to suspect that that may have been deliberate. In Dyne's assessment, Lieutenant Colonel Bush viewed the settlement of such a large fraction of liberated Africans in the military as an end in itself, regardless of what military need or their prospects as soldiers. As with much use of European documents about African geographic, cultural, social, or political identifiers, extrapolating African origins from what is written in military records can prove somewhat inexact, but the data is nevertheless revealing. This paper is a preliminary examination of about 60 service records. Over the nine years that it's there, it's about a total of 150 different people, because people come back. Um, what I do in this paper plays with mostly 60, although I throw in some extras, which is sort of bad data management, but good for paper presentation. <laughs> um, or at least for paper presentation in the middle of a project. Um, what I, this paper, this paper is a preliminary examination of about 60 service records comparing the naval musters, which were in the previous slide, with British Army service records. There are numerous methodological questions, there are numerous methodological questions beyond the questions related to African terminology. These soldiers, most having recently received English names, sometimes over the course of their lives, changed either given or surnames. Thus, in some instances, a service record was found to be a close match for someone apparently aboard the Romney, but the given name had changed at the time of discharge. There are also some errors and inconsistencies in the online and print versions of the records, because this was a subcontracted. I don't know if any of you worked in these the British military records. This was a huge subcontracted project. 
So for example, Private John Hackett, who did serve in the 2nd West India Regiment, is incorrectly identified in the online index as Samuel Hackett, but then if you go to, if you, if you open the document image, then you see, oh no, it really was John. There weren't two people with last name Hackett on the ship, so it's a bit, only by investing sort of scan documents of these kinds of errors apparent. In other cases, scan document images are attached in the online system to incorrect names, and you can't tell whether these are modern errors or you know, sort of pre 19th century errors. Additionally, in a few of the original records, there are name discrepancies or changes even within a single file. The present review of these records as identified likely matches only based on concurrence of multiple relevant details. Thus, the present review relies so on comparing the Romney's musters with later discharge records. Further analysis, which I hope to do, can be done with things like pay lists and other war office materials to sort of match up individuals. Um, what these are, and you can't quite see it, but there's um, discharge records um, show, the front page is always like that, and it has a name, and it's got a place for place of birth that you can just barely see that it's, in this case, just Africa. The other thing, and I should have flipped that around and I didn't, on the back page of these, medical, these discharge records where they send you, they're designed for condition. Were you injured you know, in, in war? But it, what you cannot see, because I was careless and didn't flip that around, is that for these Africans, about a quarter of them have scarifications. All right, so in the place for markings, which is designed in the military discharge for missing a limb, that you essentially, when you're dealing with liberated Africans in these records, you get something quite different. That's sort of very useful to the kind of work, origins work that we're doing. Um, I have no idea where I am on time, probably way over already. Um, so of these 16 men of the 1st West India Regiment, the Romney Musker identifies five as being of Igbo or Calabar. Oop, is that what? That's not where I was. Was I there already? Yes. Um, the, of, the, of these, the 16 men of the 1st West India Regiment, that is the first to arrive, the Romney Musker identifies five of being of Igbo or Calabar origin, four as Yoruba, one as Karamanti, um, an additional five are identified by terms of origin with unclear geographic or cultural reference, which I'll say a little bit more about. Ages are listed um, as unknown for some. Two soldiers who later appear in discharge records show enlistment dates in the late 1820s. Most soldiers who enlisted directly from captured slave ships in this era were in their mid to late teens or early 20s. Thus, one might surmise some things about age range of the detachment being in their late 20s or early 30s. The initial muster of the 18 men who came from the 2nd West India Regiment via the Bahamas is somewhat less detailed, but cross-referencing with dis Army discharge records where available reveals a similar de demographic. While only three of these men have their African birth identified in the muster, an additional 12 are shown to be African-born via other records. 10 of the 18 show confirmed enlistment dates at Sierra Leone in the late 1820s, undoubtedly in this case being men taken from captured slave ships, processed through the Mixed Commission Court, dealing with the slave trade matters at Freetown. Eight within that group have identifiable African regional origins, two from the Gold Coast, three likely Yoruba, two of Igbo or Calabar origin, one identified as Popo um, from the Bight of Benin, and there are specific age claims for half of the group. Um, please work with the next correct. Is that the one that's not what I want? That's the one I want. That's what you end up with sort of overall. And I said, when I did this, I was just playing around with this data. I was like, wait a minute. These are all liberated Africans. I started this project because I was interested in what it meant to have black people trying to police the slave trade as opposed to white ones. All right? When I did this just for, like, you know, these, you know this seems to be essentially a liberated African detachment. These 34 men who remained aboard the vessel for the first two years of its posting were the people who made the first impression on Cuban authorities and the other Havana observers. So when the Cubans are saying, we don't want those black people there, they are not saying we don't want general black soldiers there. They are actually saying something about liberated Africans. Being roughly half of by Benin, their geographic and cultural origins mirrored similar patterns in the 19th century slave trade generally and the Cuba Cuban slave trade in particular. This was a logical demographic circumstance arising from the fact that people rescued from 19th century slave trade, slave ships, excuse me, were overwhelmingly destined for either Cuba or Brazil. From a cultural and political standpoint, however, these men were literally people who had escaped the fate of Cuba's own enslaved population. This meant two things for any interactions the soldiers might have had with Havana's black population. First, they would likely find people with whom they had significant linguistic, cultural, and experiential commonalities. And second, they would have very different, and when I say sort of inherently radical stories, not meaning political change radical, but a very different set of stories about their profoundly different outcomes 
all right, amidst the dismantling British slavery in neighboring Caribbean colonies and serving in the military as opposed to ending up in Cuba. The prospect of these kinds of liberated African soldiers taking any sort of shore leave understandably raised concern. It's not surprising, as is discussed elsewhere in this project, that Captain General Miguel Tacón initially sought draconian and practical restrictions on these soldiers' potential access to the city. Preliminary examination of the military personnel records from the entire eight-year period suggests that the makeup of the troop stations at Havana did not change. So for example, in 1840, the year when the most significant controversy around the Romney occurred, the vessel was staffed three years later by a contingent of 30 black soldiers from the 2nd West India Regiment, and that they are combined into this data here. who had arrived in November of 1839 from Jamaica. Combined muster and discharge records yield specific service records for about half this group, with almost all of those records showing men recruited at Sierra Leone in the late 1820s. This not only remained consistent with prevailing modes of staffing for the West India regiments in this era, but also presented an added practical advantage related to slave trade suppression. Who better than African-born people, many themselves rescued from slave ships, to interact with newly arrived liberated Africans, who might end up aboard the Romney as a part of the ship's primary mission? In fact, the detachment presented present in 1840 even included four men enlisted in the Bahamas and Belize in 1834 and 1836, respectively. These men could very well have been rescued from slave ships, processed at the Havana Mixed Commission Court, and then sent back into Havana. There's a couple, and I got these out of order. I'm not sure if you can, how well y'all can see this, but where are we? Um, two things about this. This is what the data looks like when I sort of put it together, that you've got their names and these claims of where they are born. Some of the things that are interesting to our work here, that when Robert Ingram is discharged, um, he's um, marked as Aku. And then there's, I have a little note to myself over here that sometimes people are marked as Aku, and then later in the same records, that same person is identified as Yorba. And we were talking about that, that these are military records. They're not in any context in which there are other um, with which there are other Yoruba around. So what's going on with the choice to identify some people as Aku and others as Yoruba, or sometimes as both? Uh, they're from Freetown. Yeah, yeah. Aku Yoruba from Freetown. That's why they're called Aku. Yeah, no, no, but, but why? No, I know, I know that. But the why sometimes they call them Aku, and then the same person, they change their mind and say, oh, he's Yoruba, and that's a sufficient designation. It's not... Why, I wasn't asking why I call them a coup at all, but why it happens to switch back and forth. It gets a little messy because it's only about half of the data where you have a reference that specific. Um, some you've got none, but a lot more you've just got Africa. Like this here, that's the Ganga speaker that I was tracking down. But in his military records, I know the Ganga part because what he's known to speak in Havana, but not from the military record itself. Um, and it's my friend from Belize. You've got some of these, these ones that are listed in 1833 in the Bahamas. These are almost, and then at Honduras, which is Belize. These are almost certainly people that have come off of slave ships, transferred out of Havana, taken as sort of displaced, liberated Africans into the Bahamas and Belize and enlisted in the regiments there and then sent back five to, five to six years later to Havana to do this kind of policing. Um, there's what is my time? I'm way over. Let's try to finish. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So that's 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 that is that is essentially the the data that I'm working with. I will. And what you know, there is something going on with the choice to staff this with liberated Africans. And I want to say a couple things by way of conclusion. All right. One is that this is I'm situating this story in Havana, but this connects very much to how liberated Africans interacted with a variety of free and enslaved blacks outside of their garrison. So this question makes sense in Sierra Leone. It makes sense even in Kingston, in the Bahamas. We're asking about liberated Africans and what does it mean to have them in these regiments. There's a, there's a particular affront in Havana, and the, the Cuban officials give us a way of navigating that. Um, but it's not that this interaction is any different from how we think about liberated Africans interacting with, say, other Africans in Freetown or in Kingston or in the Bahamas, that this is about how liberated Africans interact and how they are perceived. Um, second thing that is worth mentioning here in terms of how data works, um, you also have women and children aboard this vessel. They're a lot harder to trace. I just, I had a sort of longer statement on that. They're not in the military, but they're military wives. 
sometimes you've got one woman who's brought from Belize to be with her husband on the vessel. You have children who are brought with the regiment there, and that gets a little bit messier. Are these wives also African? Why are the children brought? There's other sort of complicated things going on there. Um, in the end, though, what I wanted to sort of, I guess, focus on, that given the fact that these soldiers were not simply, quote, black and British, but also liberated Africans, their presence and who they chose to interact with meant things beyond the broad politics of abolition and race. To borrow phrasing suggested to me by um, historian Sharika Crawford, when they went ashore in Havana, they were looking for their people, and more importantly, who did they view as their people? Specific ethno-linguistic speakers, other Africans free and enslaved who had left similar parts of Africa at similar times in theory, or did they view themselves as free blacks with their own special anti-slave trade story to tell? I'll leave it there and take questions. Thank you.